Chi, mugwort, energy, Taoism, all discussed on today's episode of Ben's Learning Lounge, all about acupuncture. So I'm joined by the brilliant individual known as Larissa Mosca. Not only does she have years of experience in acupuncture, is professionally accredited, an acupuncture graduate, studied in Taiwan and have her own practice, but she's also my local acupuncturist that I visit semi-regularly. I previously was quite skeptical, to be honest, about the practice of acupuncture, but after attending it myself and finding it helped massively when it comes to my migraines and uh, fatigue and that sort of thing, and then I read some studies on it, which backed all that up, uh, I had to learn more, and obviously I kept wanting to attend as well, so I have to thank Larissa very much for, for joining me today on the podcast. So we had a brilliant chat, obviously about acupuncture as a whole, including things like the fundamentals of Chinese medicine and the holes that Western medicine struggled to fill including conversations surrounding COVID, for example, even nature. It was just a great time, and you'll learn a ridiculous amount about things that you didn't even know that you didn't even know. So get yourself a tea, a coffee, a cocktail, I don't know, whatever tickles your fancy. Sit down and enjoy the episode. All right, so Larissa, thank you very much for agreeing to be on the podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here. You're very welcome. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for asking me. Yeah, no, it's exciting really because I've been sort of going to you for acupuncture for I think it's a few months now and just it kind of occurred to me there while I was thinking about starting off the podcast again I was like, I should get Larissa on, like this is brilliant because I don't know that much about acupuncture really I've never really explored it no, but you no. know, it, it's it's one which which I feel like it, it exists within the Western world but it's not commonly discussed so I think it's a perfect opportunity to, you know, delve into it with you a little bit more Absolutely. And as you go for treatment, you get to learn a few bits and pieces. And I suppose you get curious and you want to know more because you experience things in yourself. And as you're feeling those feelings, then you start thinking, how is this happening? Yes, yes, so, exactly. Yeah. I definitely want to later explore some of the, the sensations of things that I felt and, uh, and go more into detail with that because I've, I've got a lot of questions regarding that too. So mm -hmm. I think we should start off with the basics. The big simple mm -hmm. question of them all, uh, what is acupuncture? What is acupuncture? So there's different ways of answering this question, really. I could answer it by using Western terminology, but I think I will start by answering with using perhaps terminology we're not used to, but it, it's it's oriental terminology. It's where acupuncture really comes from. So acupuncture comes from China specifically, but we could say that it's present in, in Asia in general. So acupuncture right. is present in, in Korea, in Japan, but predominantly we think it started in China. And it's a very old form of medicine. It started about, well, some people say about 3,000 years ago. Some people say about 5,000 years ago. So very old. Um, well, I say, I say Jesus, older than Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> older than Jesus, absolutely. So, you know, it could be, what, about 2,500 BC, 3,000 BC, or wow. it could be as early as as a thousand BC. In any case, it's a really old form of medicine, and it started before written records were there. So all we know, all we know from the fir very first books that were written, is what people were recording at the time. But I bet you that before they started recording it, it must have been practiced for yeah. hundreds of years, if not thousands, really. Um, so one of the very first books is the Yellow Emperor's classic of medicine which is a very interesting book and it was written during the Han dynasty so we're talking about 200 BC as well very yeah. old book yeah. and that's the first one that talks about acupuncture and what acupuncture is and what it does so literally acupuncture is the insertion of fine needles into particular points we've got fine needles now they didn't back then the needles they had were a lot thicker obviously back then uh, but the principle is the same the ones we use today are very very fine as fine as a human hair really you barely feel them when they go in and they're inserted at um, specific points which we can call acupoints the same points that people use for acupressure sometimes mm -hmm. those points uh, run on meridians so we've got 12 meridians in the body and a meridian is, um, let's call it an energy line. Some people describe it as an imaginary energy line. Um, 
don't particularly like that expression. To me, they're very real, um, even if not tangible, but I feel the real, I don't feel they're imaginary. Think of those channels as, as a lymphatic system or the cardiovascular yeah. system. So something that runs through the body and connects everything, connects your arm to your leg, to your head, um, just connects all the different parts of the body and make it into a unity, the person that we are. So by inserting a needle in a particular point, say in your hand, you could affect um, what's going on with your lungs. You could affect something with your legs as well. It, it, it's just a way of, rebalancing your whole body so it's a bit of a strange concept for us western people we're not used to talking about uh, energy we're not used to talking about blockages and things like no. that but in asia there is this firm belief that when we're healthy our body is in harmony when we become unhealthy something gets literally stuck in the body so you could have a blockage which could be an excess blockage so say for example when you catch catch a cold that's an excess because it's something that has invaded your body so there is a blockage caused by excess and by using acupuncture you can remove that excess and bring back harmony also it could be the opposite so we could have what we call a deficiency so um, say for example you're preparing for an exam you studying really, really hard, you don't have time for yourself, you don't eat well, you don't sleep well, you create a deficiency in your body. And that could cause disease just as much as, um, yes. as a cold invading your body can cause disease. And again, by using the right uh, needles in the right pressure points, you can rebalance your body and bring harmony back. So you just clearing the blockage and making sure that your energy your blood flow everything flows in the appropriate way i think that's very interesting too this idea of how flow works within the body right because as you sort of touched on there in the west it's not really thought of in the sense of not only things about blockages but also just treating the body as sort of one entity mm -hmm. you know when there's a problem with one area of the body you go to the doctor they tend to just look at that one area of the body and then you That's could spring right. up and have six other issues but they won't check out them all as one thing you know you'll go to a neurologist for the brain and then you'll go to an immunologist for the disease or you know it's all very separated like that even even in my own family you know i come from a family my brother and my dad are bodybuilders and their mm -hmm. whole idea is obviously you know you look at the body as separate parts you do your arms you do your chest you do so yeah. i think naturally through that i'm very used to seeing the body through the lens of individual separate pieces Exactly. And, and that is really frustrating for me because we're not just a, a random bit of body parts put together. We are, we are a body and a mind and a spirit. Usually it is this trilogy in Chinese medicine, your body, your mind and your spirit all works together. So your, your shoulder is connected to your leg, your leg is connected to your head. And yes, physically, they're a little bit separate in the body. So your shoulder doesn't touch your leg. But if we think about out our cardiovascular system well the blood that runs in your shoulder will reach your leg as well so we are connected really it's, it's just a way of seeing things differently and seeing that we are all connected to the greater one yeah. which is yeah. ourselves really and as for diseases as you said you go to a specialist but if you have a, a shoulder issue it could be a neurological issue it could be a muscular issue um it could be arthritis so it could be in your bone but it could also be emotional, you know, a, a, yes. a lot yeah. of emotional issues get stored in the shoulder, particularly things that weigh us down in terms of responsibilities, um, going through the grieving process as well. Grief tends to be stuck in the chest or in the shoulders as well. So sometimes a physical pain is actually a manifestation of something emotional going on. So you feel it, you perceive it as a physical pain, and it is definitely a physical pain, but you may have all the CT scans and MRIs and nothing shows up, everything yes. is absolutely fine. I've had a family member who had 
a very similar thing just just adding on there um they were going through a difficult time and they mm. felt a sort of it began round their gut you know sort of like a bloating feeling like a pressure like a stress when they were going through a tough time and that slowly they they described it as a sort of grew within their body mm. and it got larger and larger and uh, slowly they started to not be able to breathe properly but on the scans nothing was shown yeah. it wasn't like there was anything actually there but they were going through a, a period of, of real stress during that time and it wasn't until after that stress was gone that growing sensation that actually went over they said their heart and their lungs and throughout their whole torso actually began to fade away Absolutely. And this family member you're talking about probably was dismissed by doctors because, you know, yes, nothing yes. showed up. So it probably wasn't real. It was very, very real. It's just that it was the mind that was um, telling us. See, our bodies and our minds are fantastic at actually telling us what's going on. So we always have little signs. Um, the trouble is we don't know how to read them. We've lost this art of interpreting what's going on in our body. And when something is wrong, instead of paying attention to it, um, we take a painkiller, you know, just take a painkiller yeah. and get the pain to go away, which is not the point, really. I mean, no one wants pain, but pain is there to alert us. Pain is there for a reason. So actually following that pain could take you to the origin of the problem rather than masking it and hoping that it go away. So yes. it's... Uh, yeah. It, it, it's very interesting. This is what's drawn me to acupuncture from the beginning, the fact that it's um, it, it's different from what we generally do in terms of health. It considers everything. And I briefly mentioned body, mind and spirit before. It, it is really a trilogy. Body is the physical part of us. The mind is our thinking brain. But our spirit is our essence. And I'm not talking in religious terms here. I'm talking more of who we are as people, you know, our core beliefs, um, really what makes us human, that's what I would consider our spirit. And our spirit can get can get diseased as well, can yeah. get ill, yeah. you know, but particularly during uh, the pandemic, uh, when we oh, were in definitely. lockdown, many people's spirits got ill during those times because it wasn't just the insecurity of not knowing what was going to happen it wasn't just the fear for our lives it was the fact that we got removed from society all of a sudden in such an unnatural way like we couldn't even imagine it you know just being removed from family from friends from relatives not being able to go to work not being able to earn a living you know, that affected yeah. a lot of people, not being able to earn a living. It's something that we would have never imagined, you know, oh, the government's yeah. going to forbid us from earning a living. It, it, we couldn't have imagined it, but but it did happen. And and so that affected that part of us that is our spirit, um, you know, and, and many people suffered from it during the pandemic. And some people have started suffering from it now. Sometimes when you have a period of stress, it's only when you come out of the stress, just like you were saying before, that you put two and two together and realize what's happened. Yeah, definitely. I think it's a good point there, too. You mentioned about this sort of separation from society people have experienced and how that affects something more deeper than the body, sort of the spirit. Because I was speaking with a forestry manager a long ago on the podcast, and we were mm -hmm. talking a lot about how you know, nature really does influence one's spirit and one's ability. Mm. And and it's not very easy in a sort of a study sense to determine exactly what's going on, you know, exactly what's happening when a man is put next to a tree that sort of lightens up his spirit. We just know that there's sort of a, 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 a an evolutionary connection there of one being embracing the nature, you know, of, of being around it that sort of allows man to thrive. And I suppose perhaps there is a similar aspect within acupuncture. You know, it's Absolutely. not always exactly confirmed. This is exactly how this works, but it's tapping into something probably a little bit deeper than, you know, mm. just looking at the gallbladder or just looking at this part of the body. It, everything in connection, there's so much more that's deeper in that that I think it's really hard as well to pin down in specific studies too. Absolutely. It's a lot deeper. It's difficult to explain. Uh, a lot of it is still the big, great unknown. And, and I know that many people are not comfortable with not having answers. Um, but it's only by really diving into 
big unknown that we can uh, gain new knowledge. And as as for nature, I mean, we are part of nature, really. Mm-hmm. It's uh, We wouldn't be alive without nature. We wouldn't be able to exist on a different planet. We are part of earth so we we're here just like trees are here and uh, i think over the years we got very disconnected from nature as well and that's another thing that acupuncture is um in my opinion it kind of brings us back to our roots because it's very much centered on what is happening uh, in nature so very first descriptions about acupuncture they were all done by um, observing nature and using nature to describe it so when talking about the meridians the ancient Chinese described it as uh, rivers that run through China Um, so they use those analogies quite a lot There's a great quote. I don't know if you know much of the work of Alan Watts. I'm quite a fan of his. And he gave a good quote, which said, there's a solar system inside a galaxy. And one of the peculiarities of this solar system is that at least on the planet Earth, the thing peoples in the same way that an apple tree apples, you know, and it reminds you the same thing, Mm. like what separates naturally the river running from, you know, the bloodstream. It's it's all the same. It's all part of the same system. Uh, But as we remove ourselves and we treat things as separate, you know, we really sort of lose lose touch of the world. So I was interested in knowing during COVID times, whether that would lead to an increase or decrease in the amount of people seeking acupuncture treatment. Mm, Absolutely. There's been a change. There's been a really big change in in many aspects. First of all, I think the pandemic has meant that people started looking at the lifestyles a little bit more because, you know, we've all been been on a hamster wheel for such a long time and actually stopping during lockdown, stopping and actually having time for reflection meant that most of us started taking our health seriously which we always neglected before because you know yes. you're healthy you take it for granted you don't worry about it then all of a sudden this virus comes along and it can actually kill people so that's when people started worrying about their health so when i reopen after the first lockdown which was july 2020 Uh, There was a little bit of hesitancy from some people, you know, people were still scared about going to places, but I noticed um, a lot of bookings, I noticed a lot of new people starting acupuncture, and a lot of people who I wouldn't have seen before the lockdown, so people who wouldn't naturally have been drawn to acupuncture people who who are more skeptic, let's say, or people who believe more in uh, uh, taking a pill or Mm -hmm. going to the doctors rather than taking health into their own hands. So that's the first thing I noticed, really. People are taking their health into their own hands a lot more. And um, and the other thing I've noticed, particularly in the last 12 months or so, is um, people's issues have changed. Um, There's a lot of back issues, a lot of shoulder issues due to posture. People working ah, from home yes. change a lifestyle. A lot of neck issues because people don't have the computer or laptop at the right level as you would in an office. You know, some people work from the yeah. kitchen. Table. Or you stare at your phone, you know, and that's always way down, you stare way at down your low. Phone. When, whenever I put my head up, oh, I always, my neck is always, I always feel it there. That's a reminder of my probably slight phone addiction is whenever I turn my head 180 degrees up. Exactly. And most people are guilty of doing that because we've got more time on our hands at the moment. But also, if you work in an office, you sit at your desk and then, you know, you start to say typing your email, then you turn around and you talk to to people, you go and make coffee, you walk about. When you are at home, you sit in front of your screen for about an hour, two hours, maybe three hours if you're really into what you're doing and you don't move. So your posture yeah. doesn't move. You don't interact with anyone. And that's what's causing problems. So yeah, physical problems are arising from, from working from home, definitely, um, as well as emotional ones, because people feel lonely. And from feeling lonely to becoming depressed, it's a very small step. So I can see quite a lot of that. Um, anxiety is on the increase as well. Social yeah. anxiety, yeah. health anxiety, again, all dictated by... Uh, the times we live in 
But yes, things have have changed. Um, something I noticed with pleasure that has actually decreased is um, infertility. I do oh, a lot interesting. Of, yeah, I do a lot of fertility work, and um, the amount of people who rang me when we were in the first lockdown telling me that they got pregnant, it, it was amazing. It oh. it was beautiful actually. You know, receiving those phone calls from from people I work with for months and months beforehand all of a sudden saying they were pregnant. Um, what do you think is the and, reason behind it? Because I'm aware that that fertility has gone down a lot, right, in recent years. Yes, yes. So many couples struggle to conceive these days uh, because of what the expert call unexplained infertility, believe it or not, that's a term, <laughs> unexplained infertility. <laughs> Thank you, doctors. So, exactly <laughs> so nothing wrong with them from a physical point of view they get checked out everything's perfect everything's working as it should they just can't manage to get pregnant and a lot of it really is down to stress stress is a killer really stress releases a lot of uh, hormones cortisol particularly you know cortisol is the fight or flight hormone and when it's released in a high amount because your life is stressful or because you're stressing because you're not getting pregnant then you're releasing this hormone to the point where your body goes into fight or flight mode and obviously self-preservation is always there so if you find yourself in danger the last thing you want is a pregnancy you know if you know yes. you need to escape from a potential um I don't know, tiger or whatever else there is in the wilderness. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. The, the last thing you would want is to get pregnant. So by stressing about it, you're actually stopping it from happening. Uh, and it's difficult, you know, knowing that stress affects you is one thing. But stopping that stress is another. So when we were all at home at the very beginning, Yes, people were scared, but also people had more time for themselves. They weren't rushing. They weren't in the, yeah. in the morning rush. They weren't um, running to work. They didn't set their alarm clocks at half past five in the morning. So life all of a sudden became slower, probably, you know, as, uh, as if we went back 50, 60 years. And that, only that change meant that a lot of women got pregnant which was amazing really wow, it, it makes so much sense like as you explain it too if when you look at it evolutionarily of course when humans are stressed it's mm -hmm. not going to make sense for them to be ready to be pregnant it's not going to be on the agenda for their body so exactly. of course in the age of chronic stress which is you know something that we're not used to as individuals it's it's just not going to happen. So I suppose yeah it's caused a lot of relaxation so I suppose in some ways despite the issues COVID has caused it seems at least, as you've mentioned, people are beginning to take their health more seriously. Perhaps mm. people have, have relaxed a little bit more too, which, you know, that's that's at least a positive, right? Absolutely. You know, I think COVID was, um, at least it gave us the chance to have this big reset in our mind and make us understand of, you know, who we are, what we want, where, where do we want our life to go? Let's just take some time to analyse what we've done and where we want to go as opposed to, uh, going from goal to goal without ever reviewing those goals you know maybe what you wanted five years ago ten years ago is not what you want now but you yes. need to have the time to think about what you want uh, otherwise you, it won't come to you you know it, it's um it's one of those things and this is also what acupuncture can do to be honest um make you reflect make you yeah slow down um and then things will come to you. It's not a big revelation, but because you are slowing down and tuning in with yourself more, that's when things start coming to the surface and then, then you can start dealing with them. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's, that's a great point because the only time that an individual tends to have time for any kind of self-reflection is like when they're in a shower, right? Because yes. when you're in the shower, <laughs> that's right. the only time when you're not looking at your phone, when, you, when you're forced to be with your brain. And that tends to be as well when people have some of their best ideas or revelations. So Absolutely. it's no surprise that when people go to acupuncture, that, that you are sort of forced to, you know, to, to, to move away from all that. You're in a relaxing environment and it does give you, I've certainly noticed that it's given me time for reflection so it's yes. been it's it's been helpful there 
talking about the shower, there's something something purifying about water and just being under the shower and having water coming over you makes you kind of cleanses you and cleanses your mind so that it becomes almost empty and you've got time to process other things. And often when people have acupuncture, they describe these feelings of waves going yes. up and down the body. Yeah, I understand have that. Have you experienced it? Have you experienced yeah. the waves? Yeah, especially um, especially around my, uh, my my legs and my feet, especially. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's such a strange feeling, isn't it? It's literally like you've got this, this wave. And, and some people say to me, I, I swear there's something trickling down my legs as well. And it's, it's that clearing and leaving room for something else that happens during acupuncture, moving all those blockages and creating space uh, for your body or your mind to be nourished by other things. So, so yeah, I like the analogy of the shower. It's, uh, it's really good. It's very cleansing. Again, it's a natural element. It's just about yes. us being in nature again. Yes, definitely. It's interesting talking about the sensations of, of acupuncture because, you know, I've always seen myself as reasonably a skeptical individual when it comes to different practices. The thing that inspired my interest more in looking at acupuncture was when I was in Russia, for example, mm-hmm. um, I had to, I saw a neurologist over there because I was getting headaches quite regularly. It's not something I'm used to. And on the board in the neurologist's office, they had recommendations for acupuncture, pressure points, all this sort of thing. And I thought, oh, that's that's interesting. That's not something that I would imagine seeing in a neurologist's office in in the West. So you know, then when I came back and did some more research about obviously the things and how they can be caused and the connections of the body. And, you know, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of things which aren't looked at with headaches, things like, I think it's the vagus nerve or something, is it? Or, or, or a compression yeah. of, of, of liver and gallbladder and obviously tension across the head and the face and the, the neck and the shoulders. There's, there's just so many different areas that, that can be identified as a headache that it's rather silly to just go, oh, well, as the doctor did there, um, even though, you know, the acupuncture stuff was nice, just try taking a, um, a, a painkiller. But that doesn't get to the root of the issue and, and nor did it help me in the slightest. But, you know, wherever I go for acupuncture, not only do I get more relaxed, but for that day and then and the day after, I, don't, I just don't get headaches. They just don't come, yeah, you know, and, yeah. and I found that incredible. It's because, as I was saying before, we've made room, we've shifted things and your body's self-nourishing again. And, and then, you know, life gets in the way to some extent and things happen and people get stressed and you go back to your bad habits or whatever it is. And, and, and also your body can form bad habits. So if it's used to something, whether it's good for you or not, then it will want it back because that's... Yeah, even even negative to. thinking, right? Even, like, even negative someone, thinking. Yeah, someone like begins to think negatively. If they're so used to it, it becomes habitual. And I suppose that's going to eventually weigh you down emotionally too. Absolutely. And if you have a good day and, and suddenly you realize you had a good day and you had a, you not had a bad thought in your mind, then you think, oh, surely something must happen now <laughs> because it's been too yes. much of a good yeah. day. It's, uh, it's whatever we used to really, our mind and our bodies sort of program to go back there. Yeah. Um, but if you make space, like I said, often enough, then eventually those bad habits can be replaced by other habits, uh, which are better for us. Yeah, and I've been I've been more active in that too since I've been going to acupuncture because it's made me more aware of, oh, okay, well, you know, when that, when that space has been freed up for those couple of days, then after that, because I've had a break, in headaches it helps me become more aware of my actions that then become a headache so mm. you know over time it's it's become a lot better uh, which is which is really exciting uh, i want to talk a little bit more too about the process of what happens at an acupuncture appointment and what people can expect there's a couple of interesting things that i want to touch on that i know that that you've mm-hmm. done or that you do in acupuncture that i'm sure people will want to hear more about so one of them is when you once i've lied down you tend to check my pulse on both my arms, which I've always found yes. really interesting, but also uh, checking the tongue as well. You've checked my tongue before. So yes. both of those, I yes. think, would be super cool to learn more about. So the di- diagnostic methods. Um, so when you make your first appointment for acupuncture, you have a consultation. And consultation touches on a little bit of everything, really. So, for example, if someone comes for headaches, obviously we will talk about headaches. But then we talk in general about your lifestyle, your health and your well-being. And, and really, I ask all sorts of questions that people may think, mm, is this relevant, really? Um, 
it is because as I was saying before, everything is absolutely connected. Uh, so this is one of the diagnostic methods, evaluation, you know, according to what people say. The other one is uh, by checking the pulse or by checking the tongue. It's a way we've got to either confirm um, what we've been putting together as we've been listening to the person speaking. Or sometimes, sometimes your pulse raises questions. So, you know, you talking to someone new and making a nose and thinking, okay, so I've got this uh, perfect pattern in my head or why this is happening. And then you take the pulse or you check the tongue and you think <laughs> something's not right. <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's not what I was thinking. And, you know, often it's because sometimes people don't, sometimes people don't know what's wrong with them, you know. Like when I was saying before about the shoulder, say someone comes for frozen shoulder and, and they talk about the physicality of it. And then you look at the tongue and your tongue tells you that your heart, uh, the tip of your tongue is connected with your heart. So your heart obviously it's all about love and self-love and self-doubt and that type of thing so if the tip of the tongue is really red it means that people are highly stressed mm. and you know maybe maybe that doesn't match what the person has been telling you but you can see it it's there and and you've got to trust it because whatever the body says it doesn't lie but often the person has forgotten to mention stress hasn't done it on purpose Sometimes they yes. don't think they're stressed. Sometimes there are people who honestly don't think they're stressed just because they keep a lid on things. So they don't see themselves as stressed. So small things like that are important, really, because relying on people's stories, absolutely, that's that's crucial. But also looking for different signs is very important. So going back to the polls. I take the polls on both sides of the wrist. And this is because the pulse we feel for um, is connected to different organs. So we've got three pulses on the left and three on the right. You take it with three fingers. And if you are on the left, then you're taking your heart pulse, your liver pulse and your kidney pulse. And then on the other side, you do exactly the same with three fingers, but then you check the other organs. So you check your lungs, you check your stomach and you check your kidneys again. Mm. So it's very interesting. You've got to practice this for years, really, before you get it properly, because it's it's difficult to feel different pulses. But once you're used to it, you can feel the change and you can feel how your liver pulse can be very, very tight, like a guitar string sometimes, if people are highly stressed. You can feel... Um, your lung pulse being really deep so you have to press the finger a lot more on the mm -hmm. pulse to feel it if there is something affecting the lungs and then finger next to it which is the one on the stomach is absolutely fine you know it's it's just about connecting with different body parts and the tongue is the same you connect with different body parts parts by looking at the tongue and you can see what's happening if there is an excess if there is a deficiency, if a body part is more out of balance than another body part, then you can see it. It's uh, like I said, it's, it's a diagnostic tool. And more often than not, it confirms um, the diagnosis, but sometimes it raises questions. And it's always interesting when it raises questions because then it takes the treatment to a deeper level, really. Yes, so people yes. end up being treated for, uh, for something different than what they originally came for um which is even more fascinating because it's it fascinating benefits. yeah and it's great for them too right because mm -hmm. they, they they learn about an issue that they perhaps before they were they were shooting blanks they didn't know exactly what they were looking at and then eventually exactly. it's like you know here's here's something that you have and something that we can actually look at dealing with Exactly. And, you know, and sometimes people don't think about stuff that happened many, many years ago. Uh, but it can still be there just not on the surface, but it can still be there. And if you've not dealt with it, your body will give you signs. So I would see it in the tongue. I would feel it in the pulse, the pulse perhaps more often than not. So sometimes I ask questions to people or I ask things like, have you had a trauma in your life? And I always say, you don't have to tell me what it is, but have you experienced trauma or a loss or has something yeah. happened recently yeah. or maybe not so recently something that you still not dealt with 
more often than not, people think for a bit and then they say, yeah, they say, yes, there is something, um, yes. something I thought yes. I dealt with. Um, but we deal with emotional issues on different levels, don't we, really? Um, we can deal with an emotional issue to the point where it doesn't affect us in our daily life, but that doesn't mean that it's been uh, put to bed by our brain. It's perhaps yeah. still there yeah. in the background and sometimes things bring it back. What I find really interesting is that sometimes um, a fall or an accident or a physical jolt to the body can actually bring back emotions that have not been dealt with. This I find wow. really fascinating. So someone who's had, say, trauma, kind of dealt with it, put it away, and then I had a car crash and this comes back. Um, it's amazing, really, how the body yeah. brings it all back. Uh, and often people don't make a connection because they're thinking, oh, I'm here because I've had a car crash and my neck hurts, you know, it's nothing yeah. to do with uh, uh, that trauma I had five years ago. But yes, yeah, fascinating when that happens. That's insane. Yeah, I love that. It's, it's, the, and there's, there's just so many mysteries as well when it comes to how the body works and the brain that, you know, we do forget to perhaps look at things that can be deeper. You know, like, like you mentioned, if someone, my friend had a head injury quite a few years ago and that changed that changed so much about her too. Her personality mm -hmm. changed. Well, she also got anxiety after that, which that was related to the head injury, but also a taste change and a smell change. And I've been told this is a common thing, but at the time I had no idea. Like, I think she said she used to really love chocolate. And since the accident, she just cannot stand it. And there's some foods yeah. the opposite with, you know, and I'm sure that not only physical trauma can affect you in that way, but I'm sure emotional trauma probably can too. There's just a lot Absolutely. of interesting links that, that you can make that people just don't think of and I found acupuncture as well to be helpful with that and also because of that there is a therapeutic aspect to as well at the start of the sessions which which you do and perhaps it's the thing other acupuncturists do is you, you talk about you know anything that's been ailing you that week or just how generally things are going are things going well things are going bad how's x how's y and it's nice as well I think for people to just feel listened to because that's something that I've noticed yes. that we lack with with modern doctors Absolutely. You'll get five minutes if you're lucky when you get to the doctor, get to the point and then, you know, off you go. There is no time to vent issues. And and I think it's important to, to have a bit of a debrief freely because things can affect you in life and you don't know they're affecting you until you talk about it. And uh, I often hear people saying to me, oh, this is not relevant, but and every time they say this is not relevant, but it is. It's <laughs> I think I've relevant. done that to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. absolutely relevant. Many people do it because they think, oh, no, I've come to you for headaches. So I can't possibly talk to you about the backache I feel. But I only feel that backache in certain situations. And I've not hurt myself. And, you know, and I immediately think, oh, OK, that's to do with fear. It's emotional when it comes like that. So, yeah, absolutely. Everything is connected in our body. Absolutely everything. And, and the initial chart, it's part of your treatment. You're absolutely right. It's to find out how things are going, but also to find out if anything else has happened in between treatments that may have affected you and may have affected you subconsciously to the point where you don't even know it's affecting you. But I can see it because I'm listening, you know, properly yes. listening listening to what people say which words they choose the way they move as well you know we we often say treatment starts from the moment you step inside because uh, you can tell a lot just watching people walking into the treatment room you can see if they're in physical pain because obviously they'd be limping or they're a bit rigid I can see that very easily, but you can you can also see it uh, when there's something emotional in them because yeah. the shoulders change position all of a sudden. They go into this protective closing position and the eyes are just absolutely amazing. You know, with the fact that we've been wearing face masks now and most of the face is covered by face masks, the eyes have become so important in conveying messages and yeah. and it's amazing when you start paying attention to people's eyes you can read emotions really easily in it you can you can see if they're laughing as well it's fantastic when someone laughs yeah. they do it with their eyes as well so even with a face mask on you know you can see the smiling the laughing the happy or you can see the sad you, you can see everything you know as, yeah, as they, they say really our are. eyes windows are the eyes of the soul yes 
Absolutely. And it's so true. And never like now, we've actually had the chance to experience it, just relying purely on, on our eyes for this. But also, yeah, also very cool that, you know, the amount of things that get checked. I suppose at least something I want to uh, interject with too, that it's important for individuals if they are looking at receiving acupuncture to therefore, you know, go with the licensed professionals who do it, because I'm aware that there are people who, you know, they've, they've done perhaps a course in acupuncture. It does seem quite mm-hmm. common in, in a lot of beauty shops to offer acupuncture as sort of an extra service. Um, yes. But I suppose perhaps the thing that that might be lacking is that sort of As you mentioned, it can take years to understand, you know, very subtle differences in pulse to to make sure that they're looking at things like people's eyes, people's behavior. And I suppose that, you know, despite the fact that it's great that these places are interested in offering acupuncture, if it's not with a licensed person who's done acupuncture, I don't think that they're going to notice perhaps the subtleties there or you're not going to get the same therapeutic benefit you might get. from. No, no, you're getting some type of treatment, but you're not getting the full treatment in that case. So in, in a way, it's a shame for people who don't go to, to I'd like to say a license acupuncture, but we don't have licenses in UK for this. Um, mm. But if you don't go to someone who studied acupuncture as, as the art of acupuncture, as I like to call it, really. So gone to university and done the full three years degree in acupuncture. Um, we do 3,500 hours uh, of practical work. Jesus, that's a lot. It's, it's a lot. It's really tiring when you go through it. So we do supervision to start with. But first of all, we, we go to university. First year, we do um, just shadowing. So you shadow you, but it's important, you know, just standing there yeah. and watching how people interact. Uh, it's really important. And then we start working in university clinics. So patients come in for treatment and they get treated by students, obviously under supervision. And then in the third year, we're basically working for the university in, in those clinics independently. Obviously, there's a teacher that checks things every now and again, but independently. So by the time we graduate at the end of the third year, after having done our dissertation, we've done so many hours and we've seen so many cases. And this yes. is really crucial because you can study on books for as long as you want. But real people never present uh, with what you've read in the books because real people are real and they've got layers and layers of issues. So it's never just simple. And unless you, you've you experienced it, real people, you find yourself um, not equipped really to treat people as, a, as they should be treated uh, on those three different levels emotionally physically and and spiritually so if you're looking to have acupuncture I would suggest to go on the British Acupuncture Council website the British Acupuncture Council was uh, established in the 70s and it's a voluntary uh, sort of organization but you can only be part of it if you've got a degree in acupuncture by your recognizing Ah, brilliant Or um, or there's other ways. You don't have to have a degree, but you need to to sit a really comprehensive test before you can be part of it. So they they check and make sure that you've got the necessary knowledge. And when I talk about the knowledge, it's obviously we need to have an anatomical knowledge because we need to know what we're doing, where we're putting the needles. But we need to know all the literature connected uh, with acupuncture and with Chinese medicine. So theory and um, all the literature as well like I was mentioning yes. before the Yellow Emperor uh, we've actually read that book you know it's, it's a 300 year old no 2500 years old book and, and we've read it and yes it wasn't easy because it was written in a different style but it forms you it forms you on so many different levels and it prepares you to think laterally uh, because acupuncture is becoming more and more popular, then everyone is is jumping on it. Really, they want uh, they want a piece of it. So there are lots of courses at the moment that can give you a certificate in acupuncture, and those mm. courses vary from um, a weekend course for someone who already has anatomical knowledge, like a physiotherapist or an osteopath. And those courses will teach you how to treat certain conditions, normally musculoskeletal conditions. Or there are actually courses that uh, pretend to teach you the full Chinese medicine in about six months. 
Now, I studied at university for three years, and let me tell you, I don't think it was even enough those three years. It, it was so intense. Yeah, those three years. And yeah. Cram- and imagine and- trying to learn thousands of years of practice in mm-hmm. six months. It's it doesn't sound plausible. It, it, it doesn't happen and I've um, I've actually looked at English courses for curiosity and I looked at what they cover and, and on paper they cover everything but they possibly can't it's just the mention of certain concepts you know so for example with the yin and yang concept um, are you familiar with the Tao of yin and yang yes you see it I, a lot I, in martial arts so you've got the black part going the two, into two the white one yeah, the two fish with the two little dots in the middle. We we'll spent weeks just on that concept because that is really the pillars of Chinese medicine. Uh, it's the pillars of acupuncture, the pillars of nature, really. Understanding that concept means that you understand almost everything about life. So it's it's something that can be rushed. It's knowledge that needs to be acquired slowly, gradually, and deeply. You need to go down a few different levels uh, on that with that deeper ideological understanding as well of how things work that also explains why you know acupuncturists like yourself there are often more recommendations that you give you know it's not just limited to oh you see an acupuncture because you, you know you want to try acupuncture as we've mentioned there's, there's a therapeutical benefit there's a self-reflective benefit but also you know you have mentioned to me before about certain supplements and herbs and things mm-hmm. that are potentially worth trying that, that could help with certain things and they have you know, and these are things as well that if people are, you know, real skeptics about, you know, most of the things that, that you've recommended to me have been really been backed as well by the science, if that's something people are concerned about too. But it just shows that there's, there's a sort of, there's a much greater worldly understanding that's involved in people who have practiced acupuncture for a long time, that the skills there aren't just limited to acupuncture, which is exciting. Absolutely. And, and, you know, we're not scared of working with other professionals at all. In fact, I love working with other professionals. If someone comes to me and says, I'm also seeing a nutritionist, is, is that OK? Absolutely. Great. And I always say, give them my number if they want to get in yeah. touch with me. I absolutely love it. I wish we could have this uh, with specialist, you know, with doctors. It would be yes. amazing because we would give the patient fantastic care from so many different points of view. So, yes, working together really it would be amazing. In an ideal situation, you know, one of my dreams is uh, that acupuncture one day will be accepted by the NHS. And, yes. uh, but accepted as it is, you know, with everything we bring on board, with the tradition, not just with being able to put a few needles around the point that hurts, um, it should be accepted uh, in its entirety. And that will make such a difference in patients' uh, care. Absolutely. I'd like to think they would too, because we, we do live in an age now, don't we, where there's a lot of breakout syndromes that people are getting now which which people never used to get 20 30 50 years ago the, obviously the common one that i'm tend to be harping on about is chronic fatigue syndrome and that's sort mm. of a lumped word and you know the nhs the, the way that it's really dealt with you know if we really get into it they, they pass it off they, they, they they'll send you to um uh, a specialist who who's d- deals in uh, rheumatoidology which you know whether that's how how relevant that is it, it's perhaps debated and then when you see a uh, quote unquote sort of specialist there, you get nothing from it. They'll, they'll offer you potentially free therapy sessions after like a year of waiting to get in. And then that's sort of it. But apart from that, you know, the doctor doesn't really want to hear about it. You're talking about it anymore. And with all these chronic conditions popping up, I feel like it would be great if the NHS just did a little bit more investigating into obviously if someone's got a syndrome, when there's a bunch of connected mm-hmm. issues happening in that one person, then you're going to need an approach that involves a system which connects the body and understands how to do that properly. So I like to hope that that, you know, that certainly could be on the cards, especially if other countries are looking at that. Exactly. I've been talking about coronavirus, long COVID, long COVID. Oh, yeah. And it's very much similar to chronic fatigue, long COVID, and it affects uh, different parts of the body, mainly neurologically, but it affects different parts of the body, really. And Western medicine is lost when it comes to this because it's new. But the beauty of acupuncture and Eastern medicine is that what, what we always say is you can have the most complex case in front of you. But the important thing is to go back to the roots. So find out 
something that is out of balance and start rebalancing it. And it's almost like a bit of a bit of a game. You start rebalancing one side, so that gets better. And that will have an, Im an impact on another area of your life. And then you start shifting your treatment towards uh, repairing that other bit as well. It's actually really fascinating to see it work. So a complex case is not an issue for Eastern medicine because you start working on a small part of the complex case. You don't have to understand it all to start making a difference. But when you yeah. take the Western medicine approach, it's a complex case. We don't know what to do about it. Therefore, we watch and wait. That's usually the approach. We just watch and wait until we know more, until there are studies, um, yes. which is not great for the personal suffering. You know, nothing is being done about it. No, so, exactly. There are lots of studies about um, acupuncture to help with long COVID and they're becoming very popular. There is a study, and I like to mention this because it may be relevant for some people who are listening. It's called the 100 Days of Moxa. Moxa is M-O-X-A. It's, um, it's part of acupuncture and it's burning a particular herb, mugwort. And there is, it's open for everyone to participate, everyone who has uh, long COVID. It's an English study, and they will actually talk you through how to administer Moxa to yourself for 100 days with the oh, aim of improving uh, your um, long COVID symptoms. And it's, it's fantastic. It's very little known because... You know, it's just done by uh, a couple of acupuncturists together. So the funding is very, very limited. Of course, it's not made in international news or anything like that. But it's amazing and it changes people's lives. I love that. There's actually, I'm very invested in studies too. A similar study to do with mugwort I saw on patients with chronic fatigue syndrome uh, and they did better than they did um, with placebo which was, mm -hmm. I thought was really cool to read. Yeah, it was Mugwort as well. Although I can't say I fully understand what Mugwort is. I just, something I read the other week. <laughs> <laughs> mugwort is a fascinating plant. It grows in uh, in UK as well. You know, there is a long oh. tradition in UK of the use of Mugwort. It's, um, it's a female plant, so it's kind of dedicated to the feminine, but it's got masculine qualities as well. So when you look at it botanically, there's energetics linked to the plant you can find it next to rivers or lakes um, spring to summer kind of late spring to early summer and people say that mugwort appears to you you can't look for it but it shows to you when you're ready for it and uh, and you know this is really funny because I've been looking for mugwort for, uh, for the past two years, really, since lockdown started, just as a bit of fun. Yeah. And I couldn't have found it. And um, and I was talking to this other acupuncturist that uh, absolutely loves mugwort and she lives in Edinburgh. So she was telling me where to find it in Edinburgh, which not great for me, really, living in that. Uh, you should have told me I was just up there. I would have gone and picked some from the fields. <laughs> oh, it's the wrong season. Oh, oh, of course. So I went down this path just for a walk. And a path I went down lots of times, really. And then one day, one day I was particularly not thinking of anything. You know, one day, one of those days when you're just wondering. And I saw it and it was there in front of me. And I must have wow. walked past it hundreds of times, honestly, and I <laughs> never noticed it. So I saw it and I got so excited. I was like a kid. I was almost jumping up and down. <laughs> and I found it. I've That's seen so cool. it. And, and yeah, really, she appeared to me whenever I needed to find it. So I picked some and um, I've been drying it and now it's ready to use as a, as a smudge stick, you know, like you yeah. do with sage yeah. or with Palo Santo. It's, um, it's lovely. So it's used a lot in, uh, in the East, but it used to be used a lot in the UK as well in the old tradition. So if you go back a few hundred years, people used to pick mugwort uh, and it used to treat a lot of a lot of different issues cardiovascular issues feminine problems so it was uh, was very well regarded it's it's a fantastic herb um really great on so many levels and and this is the other thing that fascinates me when you start drawing parallel between old tradition so we're going back centuries here and you find a lot in common between our western world and the eastern one a lot of things used, used to be done very, very similarly. But we evolved 
and we forgot about our past. Well, in Asia, they evolved, but they didn't forget about their own past, uh, and particularly yeah. in places yeah. like China and Japan to some extent as well, where they, they were kind of closed to the rest of the world really they preserved their tradition a lot better than we did so everything that to us now is fascinating and a little bit strange as well and we think oh we never do that but you know maybe we did three four hundred years ago we did yeah yeah Yeah. and well that's the thing too right like people don't look at the past to look at what was healthy too like certain Mm -hmm. Uh, I know there's certain uh, we've kind of this is I suppose my own bias coming in but meat eating too that's something I'm quite passionate about you know when we looked at diets back then you know mm. there were certain when we ate like a good grass-fed uh, meat diet with you know good yep. veg and things like that people were healthier uh, and nowadays yes. obviously things have changed a lot and we sort of began to demonize meat as opposed to demonizing perhaps the processing that's been going on in our food so perhaps sometimes yes. we're looking at false false friends for enemies. Yes, you're absolutely spot on on that. When our diet was more simple and it was all based on meat and vegetables and grains as well and fruit and whatever we could gather, nuts and things like that, people didn't get ill as much as as now. And it's the process that makes the difference. Um, And I totally understand people who become vegetarian or vegan because they want to help the planet. but I don't feel that's the way to help the planet. The way to, to help the planet is more to understand what we as human beings have done wrong and put it right, you know. Yes. Treat treat animals right from the moment they're born to how they're raised to how they're killed as well. You know, they can be killed humanely because yeah. one of the things in, in, in Chinese medicine is something called qi, which is this life force that it's in all of us. And it's in all of us. It's in animals. It's in vegetables as well so by the same token when you get some lettuce from the supermarket that lettuce was alive once so it it grew you know it came from a seed it was born it grew and then we're eating it we're eating its energy so that lettuce deserves to be treated well as much as a cow needs to be treated well oh Um, yeah you heard about um there are certain vegetables that give off that when they when they get chopped or when they get hurt, they actually give off certain pain. Sig- I'm sure that's like a recent study. They give off certain mm-hmm. pain signals, and it can it can sort of uh, toxify as well the vegetables if they're not sort of um, uh, killed appropriately. Which I thought was just like the coolest thing. But it it brings you back to this idea of life, you know, in in yes, different things. Yes. Life, life is in everything, really, not just in animals, but in in vegetable trees. You know, trees can. Apparently, trees can cry. Have you ever seen two trees leaning together? They're fascinating. Yes. I see them sometimes on different sides of the road, and they really lean together, and they almost like embrace each other. It's beautiful. And you know, people may think, oh, it's because it's that's where the sun goes. No, because one is on one side and one is on the other, <laughs> so it doesn't make yeah. sense. But it's it's nature wanting to be together. There's a brilliant. And- uh, Sorry, there. There's a, there's a brilliant study that was done that I spoke with the forestry manager about, and uh, it was a woman, and she found out that uh, a mother oak tree, I believe, can find underground through a mycelium root uh, its own sapling, its own sapling from itself, and give that more nourishment than other saplings around it. Which is like that's that's mental, wow. you know. That is beautiful. That is absolutely beautiful. But this is how great nature is. Nature helps uh, each other, really. All the different elements help each other. Everything works in harmony. So, uh, you know, vegetation help other type of vegetation. And, and same with animals as well. It's, it's all really, really connected. So we should be very careful when messing with that very precious equilibrium uh, that nature has. And maybe think a little bit more about what we are doing to it uh, rather than that. Uh, the processes and uh, you know yeah, this, pollution yeah. and things like that yes yes i love that and i think this is that's on that quote i think it's great to to wrap things up in, in a really nice way um so i think a lot of people who have listened to this are probably quite interested in exploring acupuncture more so that my first ending question i suppose is one that i know a bunch of people are uh, probably wish that i asked earlier but i'm going to throw it at you now does acupuncture hurt <laughs> Does acupuncture hurt? Uh, No, it doesn't. So the needles are very fine. 
um, and they're made with latest technology so that are so sharp you don't even feel them going in. We've got um, nerve receptors around the epidermis, which is the initial layer of the skin. So as long as the insertion is quick, you get past those pain receptors. Once you are in the muscle, you don't really feel much at all. Um, you may have different sensations when the needles are in, but pain is certainly not a sensation you should have. No. And if for any reason any needle is uh, a little bit sensitive, I always say to people, please tell me, because there's over 300 points in the human body. So if you don't agree with one point, we can do another one. Really, it's, it's, there's no point in leaving a needle in if it hurts. But generally, no, it doesn't hurt. Yes. Uh, and, and I can attest to that, too, because just the other day when I went to see you, I stood up and I think I still had two needles in my hand and I didn't realize it. Mm, <laughs> so, yes, yes. You know, you forget. Yes, they're you in. forget. Absolutely. You forget they're in. Yes. And uh, the amount of people who start scratching their heads and then oh, it's a needle there. I've just knocked it off and I said, well, don't worry. <laughs> it's, uh, not yes. going anywhere. We'll find it in the end. But <laughs> yes, you forget things are there and um, or you move your hands or, or things like that. No, they're not painful at all. And very lastly, I suppose, tell us where you're based. And if people are a little bit further away from that, where would you recommend that they look? Because I think you mentioned a website there. So it'd be great to hear that again, too. Yes. So I am based in Penwitham, which is just outside of Preston, Lancashire. Um, if you are within the area, then by all means, come and see me uh, or give me a ring. I always love to talk about acupuncture. And... Um, the best way to find someone who's qualified to degree level, someone who's a traditional acupuncturist, uh, is by going on the British Acupuncture Council website, which is the one that only has people who have a degree in acupuncture. I think it's acupuncture.org, uh, their website. I yes, I'll, I'll make sure yes. that there's a link anyway, so people can make sure that they get it right. There'll be a link in either the Spotify yes. or the YouTube, wherever they're listening. It's acupuncture.org.uk and then you can go and find a practitioner, you put your postcode and you can find someone in your area. And um, I always say to people, find someone that knows what they're doing, of course, first thing, so find someone qualified. But spend some time looking at the acupuncturist in your area because you need to find someone you're going to gel with because the person who treats you need to understand you on, on different levels so, so it's not just a matter of finding someone who's qualified but also find someone that understands you so it's always worth having a phone call with someone i have free consultations on the phone for people who've got questions and they want to ask if acupuncture can help and sometimes i spend 10 minutes on the phone sometimes i spend half an hour on the phone and it's just really an initial chat and sometimes people book an appointment and come and see me sometimes they don't and that's all right you know it's uh it's, it's just a little bit of my time spent educating people on acupuncture and i may not be the right person for them or it may not be the right time for them to have acupuncture but it's always always time well invested so so yes go on the website find someone in your area get in touch and then ultimately trust your gut instinct and go to the one that um that resonates with you definitely oh well brilliant thank you so much larissa this has been a, an absolutely brilliant podcast so i want to thank you again so much for coming on for sharing your knowledge um it's great to talk to someone who's really been an expert in that field and on top of that someone who uh, I actually connect with myself and you know i can certainly attest to the benefits of acupuncture i wouldn't have had you on if i didn't think it had any benefits so you know it's a great sign uh, and yeah i want to thank you again Thank you for inviting me. It's been great. And uh, yes, the more people know about acupuncture, the better. So anytime I can chat about acupuncture, I do it more than willingly, of course. Um, so yeah, thanks again.